Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to episode 155 of Sexology Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I am super excited for the announcement that I'm about to give. In about exactly a month, it's our third year anniversary of launching this podcast. In my wildest dream, I never thought I would continue doing this on a weekly basis for every week for three years. And I have been doing it because of all the wonderful support and feedback that I have been getting from you guys. And it seems like it's helping many of you guys. And my hope is to do it for many years to come. And as a way to express my gratitude to those of you that I'm in relationship for years, I I am doing several different things for our anniversary month, which is January. First of all, we recorded several special episodes that I think you're really going to like it. And it's going to be launched on the month of January. And also, my love language is giving gift. And I wanted to express my gratitude by giving away free stuff to you, to my listeners, that I think it will be helpful for your sexual wellness and you might like it. So you can go, starting in January, you can go to my page at Oasis to Care every week. For now, I'm thinking once a week. But again, if I, I if I see that you guys are interested, I get lots of positive feedback, I'll change it to twice per week, that I'm giving away free books, free toys. I know the traditional three-year anniversary gift is litter. So certainly I'll include some litter stuff on the giveaway. And for Saturday or Sunday, I'll do a drawing online. So you can see that these are true people. It's not, I'm not cheating. And my hope is to see many of you guys on my Instagram page because I love connecting with you directly. After this episode, I'll go and I'll start shopping online. And I already bookmark many things that I think you're going to like. But if there's something specific that you've been eyeing and you're interested, feel free to shoot me an email or send me a link. I might get it for our giveaway. And also, if you are happy in this relationship, I would love it. It means a lot to me if you write me an honest review in iTunes. Because as I said, this is a passion project for me. And my goal is to be able to reach a broader audience. And the higher we rank in iTunes, the more visibility this show gets. So thank you so much for taking time and doing this. Today's episode is on psychology of sexual arousal and pleasure. And our guest is Fiona O'Farrell. She has this interesting experiential way of helping us to explore and learn about our body and pleasure. I attended her workshop in ASAC and I thought that was fantastic because usually when it gets to anatomy, teaching anatomy and these things, I have an ADHD mind and I get distracted easily. But I love the presentation that Fiona had. And I'm sure you will be interested to learn about her approach and implementing it. As I mentioned, our guest is Fiona O'Farrell. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, sex educator, and ASAC certified sex therapist. In her practice, she works with clients on issues relating to sexual identity, dismantling sex negative messages, and enhancing pleasure and intimacy. She is the coordinator of the Sexuality Therapy and Sex Education Certificate Program at Antioch University in Seattle and teaches classes in human sexuality, sex therapy, and relationship therapy. Fiona is dedicated to sex ed resources to be inclusive of body diversity and challenge binary thinking. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Fiona O'Farrell. 
Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to have Fiona O'Farrell on our show. Fiona, did I say the last name correctly? You did. Yes, it's O'Farrell. <laughs> yep. I'm so excited that you're here. We were just chatting before the interview that I attended your, your session at ASAC. I thought it was fantastic. I love the creativity you brought into sex education. And I want us to, to talk more about this modality and this tool that you created, which is simply call it Paper Doll. So tell me about what is Paper Doll. Sure. So I'll give you a little bit of background. I teach classes in sex therapy and human sexuality. And one of kind of the core requirements is helping people understand sexual anatomy and arousal and the different theories that go along with that. And as I started looking for materials to teach the course content, I kept running up against this problem, which is that I couldn't find diverse imagery of what bodies looked like and what bodies looked like that didn't fit a completely normative example of anatomy and physiology. So a perfect example could be, you know, somebody who's had a mastectomy and doesn't have two full breasts and full breast tissue and two nipples. And it was very difficult for me to find imagery that was kind of anything deviating from the norm. And so what I've been working on, and I, I'm, you know, I've had a couple of, of help from different colleagues and that kind of with their input on this, is what would it look like to create a teaching curriculum around sexual anatomy and physiology and arousal that didn't just use kind of the standard medical anatomy pictures that we see, both of the anatomical systems for our genitals and for our pelvis, but also helping understand that for, for all of us, not, you know, our genitals are not necessarily the sexiest part of our bodies. It's not the thing that we think of as the most arousing and the most exciting thing that we like to do when we move into sexy space with ourselves or other people. And so I really wanted to start coming up with what would it look like if we kind of created a different approach to this? One, that wasn't necessarily genital focused at all, but more pleasure focused and around the idea that we all get to dictate what those pleasure sources are for ourselves and our body. And then two, just kind of moving into more body diversity. So images of bodies that are very diverse, whether it's what the anatomy includes or doesn't include, but also different shapes of body sizes, colors of bodies, and then also kind of trying to move away from really strict binary male-female representations of bodies as well. So kind of a really big idea. And the best thing that I kind of came up with was this concept of what we used to play with when we were children, which is these paper dolls, where there's a very simplistic kind of blank slate to begin with. And then you have the option to kind of add layers or add pieces and parts or take them or remove them depending on kind of the context or the scenario or the person. And so that's where this kind of all came from was what if we gave some more fluidity and flexibility to what we even add to a body or what we include or don't include when it comes to anatomy and, and arousal systems. And so that's kind of the basic premise of that. And, and that was kind of the launching launching point. I think it was a wonderful a tool for learning about sexual anatomy because similar to what you're telling me that I took human sexuality undergrad and then graduate program and for sex therapy training and it's always the same boring kind of image that like it feels so medical but I mm -hmm. love that what you you what you created was playful but also had lots of diversity I know that we're going to probably talk about it but you had no number of different options as an add-on. And I found that fantastic and very informative. Yeah, it was one of those things. I, I often think, so my, you know, training and background is in sex therapy, and I've moved into sex education more and more. And one of the things that really have struck me is typically by the time I have a client coming to see me, they've already tried to kind of do as much of their own research as possible. And, you know, regardless of what they have going on, it could be, 
you know, some kind of sexual issue, or maybe it could just be identity and self-esteem. But by the time they come to me, they've already used the internet heavily to try and figure out what's happening with them. And I just kept thinking, you know, it's so hard to have something that you're already struggling with. And then you try and go and find these resources. And the only thing that you're seeing are images of bodies that probably don't look like you and just how difficult it would be to to start feel like there is hope and there are options when it's when it's so hard to see a version of yourself out there in the materials and the resources and I think that's the limitation of these very medicalized versions of anatomy specifically around sexual anatomy and reproductive anatomy is you know, if you just Google, well, first I have to say, one, it's just hard to find imagery in general. (laughs) And then (laughs) two, when you do go and find it, you know, it is typically a person who's most likely white, generally relatively thin or fit. Like I was surprised at how many of the bodies had abs and had, you know, (laughs) all of the right structure. And, you know, that's a very, very narrow margin of the wide variety of the populations that live in the world and that I work with. And so it creates this isolating factor just from the get go, just from simply, do I see myself in what is out there? And I thought, you know, this is exactly what happens for our students. And I say students kind of loosely. This could be clients that we're working with and we want to help teach them something. This could be workshops that we're running where, you know, we're limited in our resources in terms of how we are able to access imagery. And then furthermore, what we're showing to our students, you know, for some people, it's the first time they're seeing imagery of genitals or of naked bodies that are used in an an educational way. There's already a lot of kind of hush-hush stigma and taboo around learning about these different parts of their bodies that isn't just, you know, how to make a baby. And then the only picture that I have to offer you basically looks like a Barbie doll. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be, you know, to me, it doesn't feel like a good starting point to helping people embrace sexual health education. Absolutely. And you're right that it doesn't include people with different skin color, different ability, body ability. And, and, and that's one of the things I loved about your paper doll and the diversity of the material you provided. But that can be disengaging for people. Right. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing research, for example, for myself, I want to learn about how to address this. And if I'm seeing a picture that doesn't sound, seem like me, consciously or unconsciously, I might not connect to the material as much. But mm-hmm. if I see something that represents me at, as the, at the get-go, then that can be a more positive experience. So for our listeners that, that they haven't seen the paper doll, so the way it works that it's you hand out this blank paper doll and then people can do drawing on it and you, they can also glue things on, right? Mm-hmm. So there, there's kind of a, there, well, first we tried to just make a broad range of body types, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of this blank body type, pretty, you know, like what we tried really hard to do is not assign like stereotypical gender identifiers or, you know, presentations with them. We just wanted to create bodies, you know, that could kind of go in any direction. And then there's all of these different options. So you can, you know, if you see something out of the the things that you can glue on or these kind of, you know, what a classic paper doll might be like a set of clothing would be all of these various body parts. So different size breasts, um, breasts with scars, nipples, different size penises, different vulva shapes and sizes, different kinds of labia. And so that's out there and you can select from those. But the other option is, is, you know, if none of these really look like either something that I feel like is connected to who I am or what I look like, then you can by all means draw on whatever you want, you know, that we have. And I think that's really important to acknowledge about sexuality and arousal is that we really get to decide what is that thing for us, right? Whether it's a body part or an action, you know, I have so many people who say, you know, the, the sexiest thing to me is somebody's intellect or their brain. And so I'm like, great, give them the best, most beautiful brain and head that you can imagine, <laughs> you know? And so just kind of encouraging that idea of it gets to start with you or it gets to start with the things that you kind of know about yourself and 
turn you on and tickle you in a way that you get to then kind of attach it to this image or this kind of blank body in front of you. And what was very interesting for me is, as our listeners know, that big part of my practice is working with people who are struggling with eating disorders and disorder eating, and they have body image issues. Mm -hmm. And I love that you had different body shapes, as you mentioned just now, that people could choose. And I was noticing this internal dialogue that this is like, oh, I want that, but that's not what my body looks like. And then what would it be like if I choose something that's closer to my body type and kind of the reaction it brings up? So I think there are lots of also good material to process, even around self-image piece when it comes Mm -hmm. to choosing different items. And something that we talked a lot about and will come up when I do this demonstration and this with my classes or in workshops is that what you'll find is we'll do what is very, very common. First, we'll create the image that we think we should have, right? And then as we start to ask questions like, is this aligned with what really, you you know, turns you on or you find sexy or, and, and, you know, I remember somebody in our talk said, you know, first I had put nipples on there, but I realized that my nipples are always for somebody else's enjoyment, Mm -hmm. not my own. And so they said, I took those off, you know, (laughs) those don't need to be included on there. So I, I, I love that is there is that kind of a process that you can go through and because you don't have, nothing is permanent on that body. You can remove and add things as much as you want that you can also kind of go through this conversation with somebody and, and as they start thinking through, you know, then they can actually, it would be fine for them. They can create the image of, you know, what they believe they, they see themselves as for other people, right. Or what they're supposed to be or what they think they should be. And then we can kind of start to unpeel and take off those pieces and really empower them to pick what they actually want on there, what's aligned with them, as opposed to what they think they're supposed to have on there. I like that. And I like to focus on pleasure and this kind of freedom of if I like, if I don't want to have it there, like the nipples, I'll I'll take it out. So it doesn't need to define like, who am I as a sexual being? And I think one other aspect that was very interesting that the diversity of the images and the, like the, the one that you were gluing on, for example, I remember with vulva, there was like so many labia, vulva, different different types, different shapes. And it was interesting to look through it. And it was a good reminder about the world, the, the galaxy of the differences that people's bodies are kind of like might look like. Mm-hmm. You, you share with us that your mom drew it. Is that okay if we talk yeah. about it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. You get trained as a therapist and then I go through all this education training. And one thing that I just kept kind of drawing a blank was, okay, I'm not seeing the visuals and the, the resources that I need to teach the way that I want to. So I guess I'll have to make them. And that really put me in a tricky position because I kept having this, I know what I would like it to look like, but there's no way I'm going to be able to execute this. And luckily my mother is an artist and you know what she tends to do is she, I, I would say her main media is is sculpture. So she's, and, but she always says figures. It's, it's, they're always human figures. It could be figure drawing or sculpture. And so she's taken all of these anatomy and physiology classes. And it was this really beautiful process between myself and my mom kind of coming up with the way to create these, these images, which we're still tweaking and working on, you know, as, as time goes on, we want to create even more and more variety. But it was also a really fun discussion because I remember my mom going, what do you mean that there are other types of vulvas, you know? (laughs) And I, and so I, I had to actually kind of find as many pictures as I could to say, look, you know, this, it was so evident to me that she only knew her own anatomy and it never occurred to her that there's this vulva diversity out there and that, you know, there's, and I, it was such there, you know, we're, we're kind of learning together and, and it was really fun, but it was, it was definitely, it was so helpful having my mom who comes from a very different background than I do 
in terms of kind of sex positivity and having open conversations around sexuality. But it, we, we've had this kind of joining moment around when we talked about bodies. It was so fascinating to her. And she really wanted to help create these images. And it was pretty fun. And the images were beautiful. I loved and how detailed it was because some of the some of the add-on were just tiny, but the detail that entail and that tiny thing was so fascinating. It was interesting that you didn't necessarily include the things that are traditionally considered as a body part. I mm-hmm. saw some strap on. I'm kind of curious, what did you think about kind of how did you arrive in that conclusion that I, I want to add this on as well? Yeah. And this, this actually was kind of, I wouldn't say the greatest challenge, but actually kind of where this all started from, which is that I work with a lot of people who identify as gender non-conforming and non-binary and I, and I try and teach those concepts, too, with my students in classes. And one thing that I've encountered over and over again in both the classes that I've taken and even just as an educator trying to come up with the, the quote-unquote right way to present material is what I found was we still tend to teach the normative version, you know, the the quote unquote healthy person with all the right parts and pieces that are totally aligned with the gender they were assigned at birth or the, you know, the sex they were assigned at birth. And then what I noticed in my classes and a lot of the classes that I took in my trainings is there would be this footnote about exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, this doesn't apply to folks with disabilities. This doesn't necessarily apply to people who are gender nonconforming, who are intersex. And I thought, you know, we have to turn this footnote around. It can't be here's normal and then here are the outliers because I think for most of the folks that I know kind of in the field of sexuality, what we realize is kind of the most standard thing available to us is that there is no standard norm, right? Mm. The one thing we can count on is that there is fluidity and fluctuation and differences. And that's the one thing that I actually can have landed on, you know, most things I don't totally know the answers to, but what I can say is, is I can always count on things being variable. And, and so I thought, well, what would it be like to, not teach a binary option and then give this footnote of like, except for if your, you know, person has experienced X, Y, Z. And so to me, it was really important to create bodies that, you know, again, allowed people to experience their sexual selves, either in the ideal version of themselves. So kind of one, one version of that is, is maybe you have somebody who is born with, you know, typical female genitalia, but they really see themselves and know internally that they're male identified, then I'm like, you put that penis on your body, you know? (laughs) And, And that could be the actual anatomy or it could be, you know, what they utilize. And, and for a lot of people that is strap ons or one thing we kind of played around with was, do we want to include things like as we build on these images, do we want to include options also like, different clothing that would, that, you know, people align kind of their sexual selves with, um, whether that's lingerie or binders or something like that. And so Mm -hmm. it was just, why don't we just make sure those options are there from the very get go, as opposed to having it be like, except if you use a strap on and then you'll have to draw it yourself. Um, (laughs) and I will say the funniest thing about that is I told, I said, okay, mom, well, here are all these other things we have to make. And she said, honey, I will draw vulvas and penises for you. You're going to have to draw the strap on. <laughs> she was just like, like, that's my line. I can't, I can't do that I one. That. You know? <laughs> she, she was very clear with her boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cool. And again, I was like doing it was more profound than what I imagined because I, I as, a, as someone who works in the realm of sexual sexuality I, I i talk about sex and body and Im, like body image and all of that but i think i was noticing all this internal narrative that was coming up for me and i think that can be very helpful for for people to kind of do it for themselves so mm-hmm. what are how how do you recommend people to use these paper dolls to learn about sexual arousal and pleasure themselves 
Yeah, so there are kind of two ways that you can do it. The first one is kind of a more, and I, I keep using all these kind of child play terms because it's the one that helps me the most. Sometimes when I'm teaching, I'll do it more of like a pin the tail on the donkey style. We'll have these different bodies up here. And instead of a person selecting their own version of themselves, we just have a lot of fun like sticking and removing all these things to just show how many options there are. So that's kind of the you know, in front of a larger group, maybe a little depersonalized version of it. And then the personal version, which I've done in kind of small workshop and work group and making sure that people have a lot of their own space, but I will use this with my clients in session too, is kind of more what we, what you saw in the ASEC session, which is pick something that resonates with you or you feel like reflects who you are, who your sexual self is. And then again, you can kind of just survey the items that are available I'll start to grab the ones that, again, you feel like are reflective of you. And, and again, kind of the big guide that I ask people to go through is really, you know, the process that we do is saying, how did you pick these things? And then for me, at least with my clients, often, again, it's if, if I'm hearing shoulds or this is what I think sexy is, and then we start to say, is that really aligned with, you know, how you feel sexy or what it is? And then they'll go, mm, you know, no, actually, I realize I do this for my partner. Or it's because I know my husband likes my boobs, you know, or whatever. And so then we kind of deconstruct that. The other thing that was really important to me is, is we put so much focus on having you know, the right reproductive anatomy. And we always assign that to sexuality. And there are so many people who that their reproductive anatomy and genitals are just really not attached to their sexual selves. So, you know, folks who have maybe like one thing that I've encountered a lot are women who have had hysterectomies. And when you see this image over and over again of a pelvis with a uterus and fallopian mm -hmm. tubes and that is the, you know, the version of womanhood, right? This really mm -hmm. sexual woman, and you no longer have all of that, all of those parts. What does it say about who you are as a woman and who you are sexually? And so there can be a really beautiful thing of kind of noting, you know, I can still have this body and all of these amazing things and identify what they are for me. And, and maybe I don't have those reproductive parts anymore. And, and it doesn't necessarily that I'm any less of a woman or any less of a mm. sexual person. And so, again, there's kind of a process that I'll do with my clients as we'll notice a lot of loss and grief sometimes of including or not including certain parts or examining how they've changed over a lifetime, you know, maybe when they were younger and they really wanted to have maybe they really wanted to create a family with their partner and that's actually was something super sexy for them. And now that they've gotten older, the idea of creating children or reproducing actually isn't the most sexy thing to them. Maybe it's connecting with their partner. So there are just so many ways that we can kind of utilize the paper doll method to help create a making sense of probably a lot of things that our clients and different people experience. Maybe you just haven't seen it in front of them. And I think one other possible way that would be helpful is just sharing it, like individual doing it alone and sharing with their partner mm -hmm. about what they perceive sexy about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that can be very empowering and can create this shared language of what each partner, how that each partner sees themselves in the sexual realm. I think what was profound for me is like this kind of again, this narrative, different narrative that was coming up and then sharing it with the group was very powerful. So I think small group format also is a, a good way of doing it. So what are you, it seems like you've been doing these classes, workshops, different wor version of it at different places. What are some of the reactions that you're getting from the participants? You know, it, it varies a lot. I think that, I think one thing that I have noticed is generally if it's kind of that more personalized process, that there's a huge range of reactions. And, and for a lot of people, something profound does come out. And, you know, there's, what that does is it invites some vulnerability. And I think that's why it's so important to kind of make sure that the space is really safe, especially if we're kind of inviting people to share or have this visual be, 
open to other people's eyes or other people's understanding. One thing I think I come that I hear often is, again, that we can intellectually understand something a lot. And I, I notice this both in talk therapy and in teaching, is that we can talk about something, we can intellectually understand something. But until we use this other sensory ability of ours, which is kind of this creating and this seeing of the imagery, that that in itself can create a fundamental shift in understanding, whether that's understanding your own process and your own sexuality or understanding the diversity and range for other people. I think there is something kind of magic if people are willing to share in noticing, you know, the, the coolest thing for me is when we do the, when we do the activity, no two images are the same. <laughs> there are never two bodies that look the same. And I think it really helps reinforce this idea that there isn't one standard template that creates a sexual person. And that's something that is so important. I think that, you know, you probably see this a lot with the work that you do with people around disordered eating and body imagery is that I think there's this attachment to you have to look a certain way and be a certain standard of quote unquote health in order to be allowed to be a sexual person. There's this idea that, you know, sexuality is kind of reserved for the fit, young and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's reinforced all the time. And when you see this range of people in the room and then also the range of the images that they create in front of them, most people walk away again, just kind of realizing, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty normal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I get to be sexual, right? Like we all deserve the right to be sexual. And I think the um, other piece no, that, that you were yeah. talking about, which was fantastic, that brought remind, reminded me of something else that I see with my clients that were struggling with eating disorder or disorder eating. They they kind of think about the bodies as this machine that they have to perfect, mm-hmm. and it's just all about like it's it's this building. I have to lean this part of it unless this is right. This is not okay. But I love the kind of focus on pleasure. That Mm -hmm. this is, yes, could be a vehicle to give you pleasure. It's a source of pleasure. And let's focus on that. And let's highlight what part of it gives you pleasure. And what do you see as a source of your sexual energy? So I think even that component of it and that reshifting can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I think that specifically, you know, I think everybody benefits from this kind of pleasure focused identification of their sexual selves and their sexual energy. And then to me, my favorite thing about that is kind of this dismantling this, you know, you use machine and it's such a good, good word. It's dismantling of this linear idea, right? Of, you know, I become aroused, something on my body indicates to me that I'm aroused and therefore I follow through with being sexual. Mm-hmm. And that template just works for so few people or it only works for them when they're, you know, 15 year olds pumped full of hormones. And (laughs) as we get older, you know, we, we need to have it more complex than that. It can't just be this, you know, step A, step B, step C. And then I, and then that's it, you know? And I think it's really wonderful helping young people understand that earlier on too that pleasure is, is something that they have the right to access and that can help them make their decisions around how they want to be either with themselves or with other people in a sexual state. And I think also it's serious curiosity. And I know for me that that, that was the, one of the great byproduct of it because, you know, like as someone who works in this realm and this area, you, you am in tune with my body. But I think the detail of the labia and how does it look like and the, all the options you guys have for nipple, it was interesting and reminded me that I, perhaps maybe I haven't looked at my body detailed enough. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really helpful to kind of think about, okay, I want to get connected with my body. And that, that was a good reminder as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think every once in a while, I will have somebody who kind of is looking at all the options and they are kind of, it's like deer in headlights a little bit. And, and I think a part of that is because they realize that they're not exactly sure what they look like, mm-hmm. you know. And I don't necessarily, like the exercise is created, so it doesn't actually have to be a total representation of you, right? Like it can be mm-hmm. your ideal self or, you know, what you want to move towards. Like it doesn't have to be like pick the ones that represent you perfectly. Mm-hmm. But there, there will be this, oh, you know. Well, it, it, you kind of named it an invitation to 
to get back in touch with your physical self and with your body. And, and for a lot of people, I'm sure you see this in the work is sometimes the, the starting place of that is either through imagery or looking in a mirror, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, there has to be like one level of separation before it can kind of come to that intense ability to kind of explore yourself on self. Absolutely. Fia, I love this tool. I think it can be beneficial for many people for as young as kindergarten children to Mm -hmm. adults or people in all like levels of education. So tell us if our listeners want to get a hold of you, they want to, as as we were talking about it, it's a little bit visual. I know we talked about details of it, but if people want to know how it looks like, what are the parts of it, where they can find those information? Definitely. So I have, um, so kind of the best option right now is to contact me via email. I am pretty into open sourcing and I'm happy, especially if you kind of want to utilize the tool either with your clients or for teaching purposes, I'm happy to share those. One kind of major project for me this year is I'm hoping to kind of establish a way to disseminate and share the imagery kind of beyond just my, my, my myself and my mom's little project. <laughs> so we've been working on kind of the idea of getting a campaign going to get some, some professionals and maybe some people who have some graphic design backgrounds and can help us kind of create a way. Some of the fun things that have been offered are, are almost like an app, like Bitmoji where you can oh, kind I of move around that. everything. <laughs> and then of course, like so there's something I just really love about like so many of these things are things that I did in my childhood right and the tail on the donkey paper doll um and i always think about these stick and peel sticker books that i used to get so you mm-hmm. have to i remember it. those back there were all these stickers that you could put on and peel off and so that's really kind of my dream is that we can disseminate it that way but in between i'm so welcome to people contacting me and my my email i think i provided as well as you can contact me through my website. And I've been very kind of, I'm so honored that if people want to use the tool, I'm totally happy to walk them through it. So wonderful. And you also have a teaching program that you wanted to share with us as well. Yeah. So where this kind of all stemmed from is that I've been a clinical therapist for quite some time. And I started teaching in 2015 at graduate level therapy programs and at least, you know, uh, I, I'm a marriage and family therapist. That's how I'm licensed. And so that's who I tend to teach. And most programs require at least one human sexuality class. And this is really where this all started is me desperately looking for resources and then basically just not being okay with what the standard lesson has looked like so far. No, you know, no knocks against what it is. I just think we can do better. I think we can do so much kind of dismantling of harmful messaging just from how we teach different ideas and what's available. And so a couple of years ago, I uh, started working at Antioch University in Seattle, and they kind of noticed that there's this big gap. We have a really great diverse population, particularly in Seattle, but I think, you know, it's changing across the country. And we have very few therapists that are trained in sexuality at all. So we now have a sexuality certificate program. There are two options, training for sex therapists and training for sexuality educators. We're in our third cohort. And so that's been a really fun project for me. And and honestly, a lot of the ideas that have come out of just this one curriculum has been something that I've tried to encourage, you know, the other faculty in the program to incorporate in some way, shape or form kind of across our curriculum that again, kind of switching the footnote, right? Not talking about exceptions anymore, but kind of leading with diversity and non-binary ideas. And so that's been really cool for me. And that's been, that's kind of been my, you know, major project the last couple of years is getting that program off the ground and launched. We are ASEC approved providers. And kind of the idea is, is to increase well-trained, competent therapists and educators in the area, just because we, we have, we, we don't have that many. And I just wish that more and more people have the training and background. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing the work and doing the education and educating therapists because I definitely see that is not the opportunity that many therapists had. I, I my background, I'm a psychologist and we didn't even have that one one required course. So whatever I know is from post 
graduation learning that I got. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you for sharing your passion and this wonderful project that you're doing with our listeners. And it was lovely to have you on this show. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you. I really enjoyed being here today. And thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Fiona. As I said during the interview, doing her paper doll method gave me lots of information about the relationship I have with different parts of my body. Because through my eating disorder recovery, I was able to work through some of my challenges around my weight and shape. But it's interesting that I didn't notice some of the inner dialogue that I have around my genital, my breasts, my nipple. So you might get surprised if you do the exercise and you see that you discover some quieter, negative, critical voices that are there that you haven't examined before. At the end, I wanted to remind you that if you want to be part of the giveaway for anniversary month, make sure you are following me at Instagram at oasis to care So when I post about various giveaway, you'll be able to see it. I love you and I cannot wait to celebrate our anniversary together in a month. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.